Hey, welcome to Beyond the Scenes. This is the Daily Show podcast that goes a little deeper into segments and topics that originally aired on the show. This, this is what this podcast is like, all right? Like, you ever lose your remote control in the house, and then you go, like, looking in your couch cushion for the remote control, and then you find a $20 bill. And you're like, yo, I got $20. Now I only owe $18,980 in student loan debt. That's what this podcast is like. Uh, today, we've got a topic that's come up on the show a few times, and it's about college athletes getting paid. Please welcome Governor Gavin Newsom. Yeah. Coaches make millions and millions of dollars. Advertisers make millions and millions of dollars in the likeness uh, of these athletes that give up, in some cases, their bodies uh, and their health for the sports. Um, I guess that's one version of a romanticized uh, system. That's the current system. And you know what, respect, there's a racial component. Close to 90% of these coaches are white, and the majority of Division I basketball players are black. The plurality of Division I football players are black. And with all due respect, this notion of student athlete, give me a break. These guys are full time, expected full time to sacrifice themselves for athletics. But it, when they're done, the next crew comes in, and it's just this cycle. And at the end of the day, it perpetuates a cycle of inequality. This is the right call, Costa, because see now, student athletes and rich kids pretending to be student athletes can get paid. It helps the families. It helps the players. It even helps the nerds who do their homework, because you know they weren't getting that fair rate before. I gotta disagree, Roy. This is a bad move. Now, I admit it's wrong not to pay the athletes, that's why I think they should expand it and pay no one. Not the students, not the athletic director, not even the coaches. Just give them all basic scholarships. Then you'd have an angry 68-year-old man with a headset in your Jane Austen seminar. There's a lot he could learn from Elizabeth Bennett and her sisters, Roy. We already know the NCAA does not pay their student athletes, but over the summer, they announced temporary rules that let their athletes cash in on their name, image, and likeness, which means endorsement deals ad campaigns, being able to create personalized merch, cryptocurrency, TikTok deals, making copyright a stupid dance, being able to build out your personal brand. This is gonna be all sorts of new opportunities for student athletes. So helping me talk about this a little bit today, I gotta get ready for this, I gotta sit up for this because we, we, got, we got somebody very honorable in the building today. She is the first basketball player in NCAA history with 2,000 points, 1,000 rebounds, and 1,000 assists, the WNBA's number one draft pick in 2020, and the youngest WNBA player in history to score a triple-double, formerly of the University of Oregon, and now of the New York Liberty, Sabrina Ionescu, how are you doing today? That was a great introduction. <laughs> I'm doing great. Did I miss anything? Was there also no. 48 blocks in two <laughs> possessions? What else have you not done? I don't know. That was amazing. Great, <laughs> great intro. <laughs> so these athletes, you know, they can have these name and likeness deals just as you left perfect time and mom and dad are not having Sabrina a little later. Talk to me a little bit about the corporate sponsors and the endorsement deals that are going on. Does this mean the NCAA is paying their players now? You know, indirectly, I would say. I don't think the NCAA is a, or the universities are, but, you know, these brands now have an opportunity to invest in these student athletes. And um, these student athletes are able to build a brand for themselves at a really younger age than, you know, we're ever used to. You know, I had to wait my four years through college. And um, now they're able, you know, coming in from high school, they're able to start navigating through agents, figuring out where they want to go, what schools are going to provide the best opportunity for them to be able to showcase that. So it's an exciting time in, in college sports. And I am, I am truly happy for a lot of these student athletes who are able to, you know, build their brands and get paid for doing so. So when you all were playing, did y'all ever just sit and think, man, I need some money. Somebody need to be paying me for this shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't, I, you know, if, Looking back now, I would have never signed any big deal, no matter how much money I needed. I would have done like a little one-off thing, like, oh, I'll post this for a couple thousand dollars. And in college, that lasts you, you know, all I needed in college was flights to get back home, flights to get my family to games, and some extra food if I wanted to eat out. That was it. I, I didn't need a car. I didn't need to buy an expensive car, jewelry. I really just needed the bare minimum. And so I think that's what I would have done. 
And so sometimes I was like, dang, you know, my jerseys are selling and the school is profiting a lot and I'm over here and I can't even afford to go to Chipotle and get myself a burrito. So there are certain times that I was like, yeah, I could use a couple extra bucks in my pocket, but it was never to the point where I would sacrifice basketball or school to do so. You're playing for the New York Liberty, but you're also the chief athlete officer for a company called mm -hmm. Division Street. Now, break that down for me. What what is what is Division Street, and what exactly are you working on over there? Yeah, so I am a chief athlete officer, um, and that's really just being the voice of the athlete for all 500 plus student athletes at the University of Oregon. Um, so this company was, you know, founded by Phil Knight, um, founder of Nike, and mm -hmm. there's a lot of you know ex Nike employees and. Um, people that worked in the business of branding and, you know, figuring out how to best, you know, put athletes and um, help them use their brand and, you know, monetize that. And so in my position, you know, at this company, being so newly removed from being a, a student athlete at the University of Oregon, it's really just using my voice and listening to the athletes and what they want and trying to be able to help, you know, them get that through this company. And so Division Street is really just us listening to them, putting them, you know, as athletes first and really helping them kind of understand their brand and figuring that out and aligning the right um, partnerships with them. OK, so then you all kind of brainchild some of the partnerships. So, like, all right, let's just say I'm an athlete. Let's just say, hey, Sabrina, how you doing? I'm Roy Wood Jr., stellar baseball player, 14 home runs in one game. Listen, I think it's time that I start monetizing myself with the Pac-10. Um, I want to come up with my 12, own. 12, 12, 12. Well, pardon, yeah, the, the, well, it's about to be the Pac-20, the way they <laughs> emerge in all these conferences. <laughs> yeah. Sabrina, I want to, uh, I think the Pac-12 should uh, have, a, I, I want to create my own cryptocurrency coin. Is that something you all could help me with? Or is it just you go, mm, you shouldn't do that? Or that's a good idea. Go figure it out. No, I mean, the thing is a lot of these athletes still have agents. And so if you're in the top, you know, division of, um, in your, in your sport on, you know, a lot of the high name, high profile athletes, you're still having your regular marketing agents that they're hiring now in college to help with that. But on a bigger, you know, on a kind of a bigger level, this is also like team based. So it's like division street helps, you know, if there's a donor that wants to help with investments and not just donate money to the university, but actually see their money work in these athletes. It's like, okay, let's partner with an investment company that will help teams at whole figure out how to invest. The donor can, you know, pay money towards all of these athletes being able to use their brand and in investing. So it is also on an individual level. Like if an athlete wanted to get involved in Coinbase and they could always reach out and we could see what we could do. But it's also on a team base with a lot of these athletes that might not have the brand and the relationships as the one or two percent of the student athletes do, but it's also giving them an opportunity to make money while they're in college as well. So what about fan interaction? Is there a way to um, I'm going to tell you a brief story and it's one that made me really sad, but it also kind of made me a little gratifying. So years ago, I did um, David Letterman. I did comedy on David Letterman. The couch guest that night was Pete Rose. Pete Rose was rude as shit. And I'll say that on the record. It is what it is. Great baseball player, rude as shit to young comedians. And like a couple of years later, I saw him in Vegas in front of a sports store at an autograph table and there was no one in line. And it just, I don't know why that warmed my soul the way it did, but it did, Sabrina. So how do you all build a bridge between the players and the fans? Because I think now, you know, when you look at social media, it's about accessibility. It's not just enough to root for your favorite guy, but you want to be able to touch him or interact with them some way. But that's also something that could lead to infraction. So how do you all help the players navigate the relationships in terms of marketing themselves and the, and the Oregon brand uh, with the fans? Yeah, well, a lot of that is team-based. Like we were doing things with fans obviously this was pre-covid when i was there but we signed autographs once a week um and we're able to really engage with our fan base but i think there's also being able to incorporate um fan interaction into deals like for example we just did this airbnb deal at the university of oregon for particular athletes and it's basically this airbnb that is all de 
created with this particular player. This player right now is Noah Sewell, who plays on the football team. And all mm-hmm. inside, Division Street has decorated it with his jersey, things that he likes, food, whatever, you know, whatever it is. It all, is all ducked out <laughs> with cool things that, you know, make Noah Noah. You get that fan interaction, and they're able to rent it out for the football games, for the weekends, for fans to come in and be able to stay in kind of Noah's house and kind of have that interaction with this is what he likes. He might stop by and say hi. And I think these are all super important um, and they mean a lot to fans. You know, it's like we, we signed autographs all the time. Little kids were crying, so happy to meet us. And you really are an inspiration and their mentor. And so it really means a lot to give back to the community that they come watch you, support you at your highs and lows. So we're trying to do everything we can to keep integrating, you know, fans and the fan experience, keeping that as a priority. This concept of paying college athletes is starting to bleed into paying high school athletes. And so, you know, and I know you know about what overtime elite is, but if and correct me if I'm giving the summation wrong, but they're basically a paid amateur league for children that are not yet in college. And so there are a few high schoolers now that are quitting their high school team to go make money now playing travel ball and they give the kids an education and they give them tutors and they give them everything they need scholastically to get them through high school. But it's this paid pipeline into the NBA that seems like an express lane to get you around the rigmarole of college athletics. But there's part of me that I'm still trying to find where the downside is to it. And I wonder if this concept of money and trying to get money as soon as possible could be a bad thing for some athletes. What's your opinions on that? Yeah, you know, I think money's the root of all evil. So I do think that, you know, if if I had to look in the future, I do think that's where it's trending for younger amateurs to start getting paid at a younger age because they want the money, they want the cars, they want the nice things. And that's kind of where social media has taken a lot of things too, with posting about it and comparing yourself to others. And so I do think it's going to get to that level, but, you know, I do think it could do a lot of these athletes a disservice as well, because there is a lot to learn from high school basketball. There is a lot to learn from college basketball. And there's very, you know, a very small select group of these athletes that are going to make it to the NBA. It's a statistic that, you know, we're all told in, in college, it's about one or 2% of us that end up going to play pro. And so I think having a degree and being able to be a part of a team and you're not really just doing it for the individual accolades and the, you know, the individual money, but being able to do it, you know, to learn and to grow as a person and player is really important. So it is going to be interesting to see, you know, where this goes and how it's going to affect a lot of development at a younger age. Now, to me, the other thing that a lot of these teams need they need honest coaches. So I played high school baseball, right? And we had a coach, shout out to Coach Logan. Coach Logan told us one day, we wasn't even seniors yet. He looked at the whole team. He said, I'm looking at all of y'all and I see maybe two scholarships. And maybe only one of you is going to get an invite to try out for minor league ball and you're going to get cut. Nobody special on this team. Get to running. Well, that's rare, um, <laughs> especially in this day and age. Coaches want to keep their jobs and everything's on social media. I feel like I was ta- having a conversation the other day. It's like everything's kind of gone a little soft. You know, it's like everything's about not offending, not being too hard, not being too strict. You know, not really You know, a coach. That's what a coach mm-hmm. is supposed to do. Motivate you challenge you to want to be better. And I think a lot of the times, and especially with coaches that are new in coaching, it's like they don't really have an identity. So they don't know what to say and they want to please the players. So they stay and they don't transfer, they don't leave. And transferring and, you know, leaving colleges and high schools is, you know, seen every single day now. So it's not really looked, you know, down upon or frowned upon. So I think that's really what they're nervous about. And so they might not hold someone accountable because they want them to stay and not transfer. Now, you just opened up a whole nother can. So, you know, the NCAA already gives the players the option now of entering the transfer window, which I just like to call college free agency. I don't like my coach, so I'm transferring to another team and I won't have to sit out a year because I trans. I'm going into the transfer window. All right. If we are giving players endorsement deals, do we eventually find ourselves in a world, and just follow me, this is all pie in the sky, 
But do we eventually find ourselves in a world where college teams get into bidding wars over players based on the types of endorsements that they can offer the players? You know, of course, above the board per NCAA rules. But do you think that this concept of paying players could eventually lead to, you know, the types of deals that make players choose where they want to go to school based on how much money they're getting and not the type of education or not even the type of offense or where their style of play may best be suited? I feel like I see it already in recruiting with kids not knowing what college to go to. And it's like, well, I can go to Kentucky and they've promised me this amount of dollars in endorsements or I can go to Oregon and I was promised this amount. So I definitely think it's going to change the landscape of recruiting as well, um, because at the end of the day, that's what these student athletes are really enticed about. If, if they know that they're not going to go play pro and they know that that's not where they want to go, it's really about how they're going to be able to build their brand in college. And if they're able to partner with brands at a certain university and they're not at others, they're probably more enticed to go to that university to start building their brands and building a business for themselves in college instead of waiting until they're out of college. So really going to be interesting to see um but i definitely think you know with the transferring and it's going to be interesting to see a lot of you know what chances brands take as well in businesses because you could be really good at one college and you're not happy and you want to transfer to a different college and what if you don't don't perform the same at that at that other college and you're tied mm. to this long-term deal so it's going to be interesting to see what approach a lot of these businesses and <laughs> brands take as well on do they give these players long-term deals? Do they give them deals only at that college? Yo, it's just interesting. There's so many layers to this shit. Cause now it's like, hey, um, you threw eight interceptions. Would you mind deleting <laughs> those posts about how much you love driving our truck? Wink, wink. <laughs> kinda wanna get your backup who's now playing better than you and was better, named yeah. the starter. It's, <laughs> I'm happy. I'm happy for the student athletes, but I'm happy I didn't have to deal with a lot of these things while I was playing because it's just a lot. Like you said, there's a lot of layers to it. There's a lot of added pressure to perform alongside the pressure that you have on yourself. So it'll be interesting. Do you think this will like breed jealousy in the locker room? Like, cause this feels like I might not, I might want to punch you in the face. You got the Gatorade deal and I didn't, but I got more points than you. Yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, if it brings jealousy in the locker rooms at a professional level, it's going to bring it at a collegiate level. So, yeah, I mean, it's going to be pointing fingers, comparing why do you have this deal and I don't. I want the ball more. And it's sometimes I think, you know, it's not going to be you want the ball more to be a better basketball player. It's like, well, I, I have to meet these requirements to get this deal. I got to score this many points. So, it's going to be interesting to see if people can keep the main goal, the main goal, which is be the best in your sport and be the best athlete and not get carried away with the nuances of these deals. We have to take a quick break, but I want to talk about the future of NIL deals on the other side of the break, because where are we going with this? Maybe I need to like endorse a college athlete. I got 500 bucks. I could trying to end hey kid make sure if you score a touchdown make sure you say visit roywoodjr.com or something stupid what does the future look like for student athletes when it comes to these name and likeness deals like you know being paid and you know equity as a whole like do you think this is a net positive across the board i think it will be but i think it's going to be telling on who the elite in their sports are and who are doing it for the wrong reasons and i think that's going to come to light a little bit sooner than it normally does. And I think it's going to be really telling um, whether a lot of these kids in high school or college are, you know, willing to sacrifice making a lot of money for posting things or for going to shoots and really focus on putting in extra work, going to the gym, having the right group of people around them too, that the agent business and all that stuff can, you know, can be really tricky. And a lot of these times these agents want to get paid and, they don't really care what's in the best interest of you as an athlete and seeing you succeed as a person. So it's going to be interesting to see who these athletes really trust, how the age of business is going to change as well. And, um, you know, you are who your friends are, you are who's in your circle. So, you know, maybe it'll make these, you know, college kids and high school kids have to mature a lot faster because they're going to have to really trust those people that are making decisions around them. For a lot of young athletes, right. Then we know money, 
could be a deciding factor on whether or not they can continue playing. But, you know, they have the pay to play leagues, the travel leagues. Do you think that model would help kids keep playing sports? And if not, would that model be helpful? Yeah, I mean, my parents had to bend over backwards to, you know, keep me in my A team. You know, it's like you play all summer long and you travel across the country, games, every tournaments every single weekend. I had siblings as well. And so it gets really expensive. So it's definitely not easy to do. And there's only kind of a certain percentage of, of people that are able to do so. But I definitely think it's up to me and it's up to a lot of, you know, the other athletes and, and people of influence that have kind of walked that path to be able to do what we can to give back, whether that's sponsored teams, help with uniforms and gear, balls, you know, everything adds up. And I just remember every year, it's like uniforms, $300 for a uniform. It's like, that's expensive for some families. And so just trying to use my platform and, and the resources that I have, you know, with my brands at Nike or, or wherever it is to be like, this will help families a lot. Let's donate uniforms. Let's fund this tournament, whatever it is to just, you know, keep having kids play, but not have to have their parents sacrifice as much as they do. Now, when we talk about gender pay inequity, how has the name and likeness deals like, how does that affect the student athletes? More specifically, has it affected the earning potential for female athletes? Because I really think, you know, with, like, preach it to the choir here, but like, how do we make sure that in this space of money already being allocated unevenly, how do we make sure that these names and likeness deals can, you know, kind of stay above the board, you know, for women athletes? As yeah, well? I think it's more beneficial than harmful. And I think so because you're really given an opportunity to use your platform to the best of your ability. And sometimes that isn't even tied with performance. So I know that there's some athletes at the you know, University of Oregon and other universities, they could be D2, D3 athletes, and they're not known for their sport, but they're on TikTok or they're on Instagram, social media, and they're influencers for whatever they're doing. And they're getting paid more than some of the men and male athletes in their sport that are average or above average that don't have an image or don't use their you know, social media platforms. So I really do think that it gives everyone this opportunity to be uniquely themselves. And if that is able to, you know, provide a steady income and to, um, you know, to help you, I think great. If you're not great at basketball, but you're great at dancing on TikTok and you can make a good amount of money, then good for you. <laughs> Here's an ignorant question. Here's a question that I'm very ignorant to. So like when you look at like, all right, March Madness, the 2021 March Madness tournament, which was during the shutdown, still a lot of COVID happening. And the way that they handled the women's training area during March Madness versus what the men had. Oregon Sedona Prince gave us a glimpse of the weight room differences in a social media video last Thursday. So for the NCAA March Madness, the biggest tournament in college basketball for women, this is our weight room. Let me show you all the men's weight room. As you can see, the men were provided with a lot more equipment than the women. Damn, that's ice cold. Because that's not a weight room. That's just the rack of weights that you buy in the beginning of quarantine and then never use. And honestly, this is surprising because usually the NCAA treats male and female athletes equally. I mean, they definitely pay them both the same amount. Let's just say I'm an auto manufacturer and I wanna give male athlete $1,000 to say, drive this truck. And then I turn around and I give a woman athlete $500 to say, drive this truck. Is there any type of regulations on that for the, where the NCAA or anyone can say, hey, no, you have to pay them the same amount of money or is it solely up to uh, the third parties who are hiring the athletes? As of now, I think it's solely, you know, up to whatever they wanna decide. But I think that's a really cool thing that I've been able to see and witness that being a part of Division Street is especially at Oregon is a lot of these donors love the teams, regardless if they're women's teams, you know, men's teams. And I think they're so willing to help us as athletes. I, us, I'm not even an athlete anymore. I forgot them as athletes at the university of Oregon that, you know, they want equality. They want to pay a, a men's basketball player, the same as a women's basketball player. Nice. So I think it does really start with who's donating donating the money and what they stand for. But hopefully at you know, one point there will be a regulation on even teams, right? Like Acro and Tumbling at Oregon doesn't get the notoriety that women's basketball does, but how can we help them 
also be able to make a living and, you know, make more money than just their scholarship checks. Or even, you know, there's a lot of players that are walk-ons on these teams and they don't get money from the university at all. And they pay their way and they still put in the same amount of practice time and, you know, the same amount of work in the classroom. So it's like, how are we also able to give money to those, to those people to not have to work second jobs? And so it's all really new and fresh, but I think with the right people that are in charge, it'll be good. Now, for everything that you all are doing right now with your company there for the University of Oregon, have other schools reached out at all with regards to how they could create the same type of relationship with their players, between players in the schools? Yeah, I mean, of course, you you always aspire to be the best. And I mean, Phil Knight is the absolute best and what he you know has done at Nike and everything that he's done for us at Oregon. And continues to do um at Oregon and so he's also kind of evolved with the time of all right NLI is now a thing what are we going to do to help the to the Oregon student athletes and you know he came up with something really fast got the right people on board and so I know that there's a bunch of other schools that you know are are trying to figure out what we do and how they can do it because it is you know a competitive advantage and it is benefiting a lot of the student athletes actually every single one of them and so It'll be exciting to see if a lot of the other schools do it. And I'm excited to see what we're going to continue to do better than all the other ones. So go Ducks. <laughs> it's, 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 it's interesting because it's like we're Division Street and we're helping be a bridge and help the athletes monetize themselves. And we want everyone to do this, but we also don't want you stealing the way that we help our athletes because you may recruit the yeah. same athlete as us. But yay, everybody. Yeah. Sabrina, best of luck to you in the WNBA season to come. Thank you so much for taking us beyond the scenes. Play me some music. Music.